hand. Let's get this going so I don't speak for too long. Um, thanks, everyone, uh, for coming. Hope you had a nice lunch, settling back in. Um, please feel free to doze, but don't snore. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about connecting research to NHS operations. Um, my name's Dan Schofield. Thanks, Craig, for the intro. Uh, my senior data scientist in the Dart team. We've had quite a lot of Dart today. You've had a lunch sandwich with Dart. I joked with Paul earlier that uh, he was the starter. You've had lunch, and I was the dessert. But it turns out you've also got dessert and coffee, so I'm the washing up. Yeah. So there we go. Um, so today, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we're trying to do this within our team. So. Hi there, I'm. Uh, I wanted to put Troy McClure here. I don't know anyone who watches The Simpsons, but unfortunately that's copyrighted, so I can't use that. So I'm going to have to act my best Troy McClure. Uh, I work in the Dart team, and we do a lot of work trying to think about things that are happening both in research and in industry and how we can bring that closer. Um, and one of the ways that we've really tried to do that is through the PhD internship scheme that Sarah mentioned earlier. Thank you, Sarah. Um, shameless plug again. Uh, and I'll try and draw attention at different points about where you can, as a community, feed into this going forward. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, the current connections to academia first, uh, how we've connected within the team. I'm now going to tell you something about Python at that point, because, of course, this is a Python track, and I should probably mention Python. Um, and to, through that, I'm actually going to go through a few of our example projects from the PhD internship scheme and some of the useful packages we've found there. Um, then I'm going to do a bit of a wrap-up, and there will hopefully be some time for questions. Uh, you may note that I am quite a big XKCD fan. Uh, Randall Murray is excellent, and this is a, a nice Python comic that he had, so you can find that online if you're more interested. I don't know if Python makes you fly. I mean, I can't say. Okay, uh, disclaimer. Uh, other programming languages do exist and are really, really good. I am talking on a Python track because I think Python is great for some of the stuff we do. But there are so many great languages out there. So, you know, I'm not saying don't use other ones. And if anything, probably some of this stuff, once we got it more established, might fit better into other programming languages. So, connected to academia, it's not new. Um, we're not saying it is, and actually, the way we've been looking at it is thinking about where we can actually connect closely as a team, and also try and then draw this back into NHS England and you know, try and grow this out. So there's a long history of collaboration. Um, that could be between different academic departments at a trust level, a national level. Um, you know, there's joint funding. There's all sorts of ways you can do this. Um, but sometimes they're mismatched, and actually, the way we found that we feel the mismatch is actually delivery times. So if you go and ask a PhD student to do something, it's a four-year program, and actually we've spoken a little bit about earlier. At the end, is there something that's going correctly, uh, directly back into the NHS? Is it joined to NHS England in the right way? So we've really focused on this specific bit. I should also say the title is about research, and there's a lot of really great research going on in industry. And I won't talk about industry very much today, but I just wanted to sort of flag that we appreciate that industry is also putting a huge amount into research. Um, the Academy of Medical Sciences have a policy program uh, enhancing the NHS academia interface, and they highlighted six recommended outcomes as part of that program. Uh, I just want to draw attention to the top left, providing dedicated research time for research active NHS staff. I class myself as a research active NHS staff member, so I'm glad that I have dedicated time to this. Uh, this concept of fully integrating research teams across academia and the NHS. And then finally, uh, nope, the one at the top, creating a healthcare system that truly values research. I put the wrong ones in light blue, my apologies. So we set ourselves a challenge within Dart. Um, and actually, we were the analytics unit back then, and you'll see also NHSX popping up throughout here. So just so you know, it's all maps to the same thing. Um, you know, we wanted it to be attractive for academia to engage with. So there had to be some kind of reason why they'd want to do this. Um, we wanted to value the individual's experience. So whoever was joining and working with us as part of an internship scheme that we were going to put on, data science internship scheme, I should also mention, um, should get an experience in both ways. So they should enjoy their time with us, but we should also get experience that they have and bring it in-house and understand better from that. How to produce tangible outcomes that build into a, a research program that we hope to sort of establish and grow. Uh, there's a, the bottom four are a little bit more about you know, the kind of things that we, we needed to really think about internally. Fast setup and, and delivery of short-term projects. These are three to five months. I'll talk a little bit about that next. Uh, they have to lead to further collaborations if we can or look at how we can integrate them into the system. Uh, high risk of failure or reducing scope. Uh, this stuff that we're looking at isn't always easy, often goes wrong, and actually, the thing you thought you could do, you can't. So, you know, reducing scope isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as you just don't let the scope creep too far. And quite often, we may have 
lags because of data access, IG dependencies, things like that. So we had to try and avoid those where possible and where they were going to cause a big impact on the delivery of the project and you know, the experience. So the scheme itself, uh, we wanted to recruit PhD students to sit in permanent roles within our team for three to five months um, and work on established individual projects. Uh, I think that word established is maybe misplaced here. We were obviously trying to, and actually I'll, I'll allude to that in a little bit, uh, these are projects which we have established now, but at the beginning, of course, they weren't established. So it's, uh, it's a slight misnomer at that point. Uh, they actually sit as, as band six uh, gender for change colleagues within our time. We have roles that they fill, and they interview through a competitive uh, approach. And they are then directly uh, supported by one of the DART data scientists. So you've met Paul, Johnny, myself. Uh, there's also another colleague of ours, uh, software developer Kevin, who is also supporting. A note here, uh, we did consider master students, and actually we've had a lot of interest in master students. Um, and I'm not saying that they are not generally self-autonomous and uh, don't uh, need to fit their placement in, but we found that PhD students works, it's a good balance that we've achieved. Uh, you can find out all the details about the scheme there if you are interested in applying. The projects, so we can kind of think of these four boxes as going around uh, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Um, Really, it was about how do we come up with ideas? How do we make sure they connect to things? But the one I really want to draw attention to is this um, you know, suggestions from analytical peers, academic departments, NHS organizations, or individual PhD students are considered. So that is a call to the community that sat here with us today. If you have ideas for projects, and on the next slide, I believe, is a link to our projects. They're all out in the open. If there's anything that you're interested in, you've got ideas around, or maybe a project within your trust, uh, within your teams that you think would be good to have some dedicated time for a PhD student, do let us know. Uh, my email address will be at the end. And the rest of this slide, yeah, is just about really how we've tried to have a feedback loop of defining the projects, talking to people about them, and then making sure that it comes back in. And that could be the PhD students themselves. They might come and say, oh, actually, I do this stuff, and I think this would be worthwhile for you to do. Oh, no, my slide hasn't worked. Uh, what did this used to say? Well, let's not worry about this one. So we'll not worry about what happened down here. And this is unfortunately the, uh, the link. So I apologize. We'll make sure on the slides that are shared, you can see that link. Um, I think a lot of what I've spoken about already is really what we're trying to achieve. You know, these projects have to have value to the NHS. They have to be of interest to students and departments. Identify tangible outcomes as soon as possible. Um, they've got to be flexible and pliable because you know, things don't work, we get that. Uh, and we've got to try and avoid too much vagueness or scope slippage. It does happen. We accept this as well. But of course, trying to avoid it as much as possible is great. At the end of all the projects, we try and make them open. And that's one of the biggest challenges, especially when you're working with data that could be, you know, slightly more private. How can we separate the project and the methodology out from the data? And sometimes that's easy, sometimes that's hard. But we want to make it open and as reasonable as possible. Um, and yeah, we want to align it to what we're going to call our research strategy areas. And uh, we sort of have four, but maybe five or six or seven, I'm not sure. Um, right, uh, probably the most important thing, as I said before, the individual. Um, successful intern projects rely on treating each individual uh, intern uh, and managing their project in such a way that gets the best outcome for all. Um, this takes a lot of energy and amount of time and actually having a dedicated member of the team working with them has been really, really great. And actually, it was mentioned by Sarah earlier, like we get a lot of learning in the other direction. I've learned a lot working with PhD students about what they're doing in their PhDs, and sometimes about just what they're doing as part of the project. Um, we have to value two parts, I think, in, in turn. That's their previous academic experience, what they're bringing to the table, but also that we can give them a good internship experience. Uh, and both aims, yeah, absolutely, time and consideration from the part of the supervisor, and we spend a lot of time trying to focus in on how we can get the best out of this. And we take feedback at the end of every uh, three to five months period with a PhD student and say, you know, what could we do better, what could we do worse, sorry we can't do anything about the admin, um, that's one of the other things. So I said I was going to pivot hard into what does this have to do with Python and another XKCD for you. It's a bit dated now because you can see Python 3.6, which is unfortunately not really supported anymore. But uh, I think it still rings true. Maybe we've got a little bit better at it and a few people have talked about ways of dealing with uh, environment management. Anyway, uh, Python is a great language for projects like I'm describing here. It's great for prototyping and development as well as being able to push stuff through to production. There are a huge number of useful libraries actually like New ones that I can't keep up with. Every day I'm like, well, this would be good. And then I'm like, 96 tabs on my phone, 97 tabs on my phone. So it's getting pretty, you know, it's pretty great. But of course, that's because people are writing stuff in the open from both research and industry that others can build on top of. And that's really great. 
also leads to really great community support as well. Uh, you know, you're not ringing someone up and saying, oh, I need the help. You can just have a discussion. People can say, this is good, this is bad. Okay, maybe some people get a bit upset about it, but not too much too often. Um, and yeah, the pain refers to the diagram. Like, you know, I think we all know if you've played with Python that this is painful sometimes. So I'm going to talk through three projects now. Um, I kind of have a, a project template slide, which is about the project in question. And then I have a slide about one of the packages we used in the project. So, and, and kind of why. So here, this first project uh, is with Jamie Burke, a PhD student from the University of Edinburgh. And it's about transforming healthcare data with graph-based techniques using Sail Data Bank. Sail Data Bank is a TRE. Uh, you've heard a bit about those over the course of the days. And we're looking at cohort data within their TREs and exploring the use of directed hypergraphs, an extension of simple graphs. Uh, actually, Fargo, how many people have heard of hypergraphs here? OK, that's, that's good to know. Because I was a bit like, do people know about these? OK, I'll do a really quick uh, intro to hypergraphs. So here we have nodes and edges in a, a normal graph. E1, E2, E3 being the edges, A, B, C being the nodes. Uh, a hypergraph allows you to basically make an edge that joins more than two nodes. So here we can see, and this is actually a, a directed hypergraph, A and B are joined to C. That's in the directed case. In the, a normal hypergraph, you would just be A, B, C has an edge around it. And what that actually allows us to do when we want to look at multi multimorbidities to go beyond comorbidities is actually model them in the side of this graph. It's really great because you can take that degree up to three, four, five nodes, all connected with a single edge. Uh, okay, so you can probably see, got double, double back there, um, probably see where I'm going with this. It gets complex in terms of computations. Every time you increase from, say, a simple graph to a hypergraph to a directed hypergraph, and your number of nodes is, so here I've chosen 13, which is, happens to be the number of nodes we use in the Charlson, which is a, a way of collecting diseases, uh, disease codes together into uh, disease groups. But the issue is, in a simple graph, 78 possible edges. In a hypergraph, 8,000 possible edges. Well, greater than 8,000. In a directed hypergraph, greater than 1.5 million possible hyperarcs. So hyperarcs is basically when you put arrows on hyper edges. This means that if you imagine going to something like the Alex Hauser, which has 26 diseases, I believe, these numbers get crazy. So you want to do this on your computer, mm, it's not going to go so well. So in comes number. Uh, number is not the only way of doing this, and probably you should be writing some stuff in a, a more, uh, well, a compiled language from scratch. But what number allows us to do is if we have something written in NumPy in Python, we can basically add this lovely little decorator, JIT, just in time, uh, and a few other things like no Python equals true, gil equals false. There's loads of arguments. The docs are really good. Um, and basically, it just speeds it up. So. Actually, this is a really bad example because it doesn't speed it up in this case. But if you scale this out to, you know, NPA range of a billion, it actually does speed it up. And you actually do pretty well out of it, pretty much for free. Apart from number can be a little bit fiddly at times, but yeah, nearly free. Uh, anyway, and that basically allows us to do these computations, calculate weights and stuff around our networks in our lifetime, which is kind of important. Uh, I mean, Jamie, as an example, has got some stuff that was taking you know, we're talking days down to like minutes with this. So it's possible with the right kind of combinations of this stuff. A little nod to Jax as well, uh, it's a Google package. Um, and this is kind of a direction that they're moving with a lot of their uh, large linear algebra stuff for uh, neural networks. Similar kind of thing going on, I think, under the hood, but uh, don't hold me to that. Just so you know as well, uh, the LLVM compiler library is actually an open source uh, community supported um, program. Okay, project two. Uh, developing large-scale language models with NHS incident data. So Chris Maney, who spoke in the R track and was actually uh, chairing yesterday one of the sessions, um, spoke to us. And the NLRS, the National Learning and Reporting System data, collects NHS incidents data from Datix, which was also mentioned yesterday. Uh, and that is across a, on a national level. There are lots of incidents, and some are severe and some are not. And clinicians have to at the center, have to try and review these and make sure that there aren't any emerging problems. So there are lots of really good examples on the website of where they have used this data to identify something in the system, and they've been able to do an intervention off the back of that. But there is so much data coming through, they need a way of sorting it. So we turned to uh, a project with Niall, who's Niall Taylor has just finished, a PhD student at the University of Oxford, um, looking at large-scale language models that have come out you know, last five years. I could probably give a whole talk on that, but let's not. 
um, and looking at how we can basically use these models to learn useful uh, representation spaces or embedding spaces for these documents to help clinicians find the documents that are similar in some way. And similar is a you know, loose term here. But basically, it was take, taking a model, fine and tuning it in an unsupervised way, and then looking at ways of evaluating these new models and new representations, looking for failure modes. Uh, and actually, to do that, we used a package called Checklist, which I would really recommend, and I'm going to talk about on the next slide. Just a couple of things to nod at. Hugging Face Transformers, amazing package. If you want to do anything in the NLP space these days, you'll probably be using it. And Declutter is a really cool thing that came with Alan AI uh, last year, and it's using contrastive learning to learn better embedding spaces. And that's basically saying, should these things be close together or not? And then using that as a learning mechanism to put them close together or not. Turns out it's really good. Okay, next slide. So, checklist, what is the point of checklist? Well, checklist is basically taking software testing to natural language processing models, or language models, I should really say. Um, we basically had a new domain that we wanted to put this on. A lot of the open language models, they, they don't work on healthcare text. Some of them work on biomedical stuff, but they definitely don't work on NHS text without at least uh, pre-training them a little further or maybe doing some kind of fine tuning. Um, we actually put some downstream pseudo tasks. Uh, ask me about that later if you want to know a bit more. Uh, but basically this allowed us to have a supervised task. And then we empl employed checklists to check whether our NLP model was behaving itself if we made a change. Uh, checklist comes with three kind of ideas around testing. Minimum functionality, does it do the thing I expect? Invariance test, if I change something in my sentence that shouldn't change my prediction, does my prediction change? So for instance, changing gender should not change the severity of an incident. And finally, directional expectation test. Harder to do in a patient safety thing, but you can imagine this in a sentiment analysis model. If I add a negative sentiment on the end of a positive sentiment, it shouldn't get more positive, it should get more negative. Thus, that is checking that the directionality of your expectation has changed in the right way. And finally, I added this uh, similarity, similarity of embeddings test. This is one we're working on, but it's not done yet. Basically, this allowed us to develop a suite of tools to test the models that we were building on patient safety-like things. Okay, patient safety like things through a nice interface and actually means you can scale it pretty well. I'm gonna speed up slightly through this one because I realize I'm running over a little. Project three, uh, this was uh, Kai Zhang and Sarah Hickman. Kai's a PhD student at Imperial and Sarah was just finishing her PhD at Cambridge. Uh, she's gone back into healthcare now. She's uh, from a medical background, but she's doing a PhD in AI. Um, automating text descriptions from imaging. So this was all about trying to learn the same representation space for images and text, such that you could use that space to generate text given an unseen image. So this is built around some work uh, from OpenAI called CLIP, Contrastive Learning, uh, Contrastive Language Image uh, Projection? The P, I've forgotten. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a good paper. There's a really good blog about it there. Um, and this is this way of doing it. You have a text encoder and an image encoder. You basically work out from a contrastive point of view whether the image and the text should be close together or not. We were looking at this for x-rays or radiology uh, reports and basically saying, can we learn something useful? And there were lots and lots of really good stuff out there to, to help us do this, uh, and the clip package was really good, although in the end we wanted to um, change it in a certain way. So we didn't actually get to use clip directly, we actually used a slightly different package. But finally, just to say, this report, uh, report and uh, the code is actually online. The other two are coming, uh, watch this space. In project three, PyTorch Lightning is the thing I want to bring up here. So PyTorch Lightning wraps PyTorch. Uh, it's a way of basically removing all the painful boilerplate that PyTorch has um, and also allows you to be very flexible on the type of hardware you're using and that's why it was really important for us. Because you've got images and text, it gets pretty heavy duty on GPU usage. So what we actually did was through PyTorch Lightning, we were allowed to basically write the same code that would run on a CPU, a GPU, or a multi-GPU setup, although we didn't use those very often. Final thing. This really relies on distributed data parallel, which comes from uh, PyTorch. Really, really cool bit of uh, way of distributing your data across multiple uh, devices, so keep an eye out for that. So really, really short on time, so I'm gonna be quick through this one. We're trying to join research to operations. So far, I think we're not quite there, but we're really thinking about how we can do this more and more going forward. Um, I'm really gonna pull out just three from this list of eight. Uh, please feel free to read it quicker than I will be able to speak through it. Um, we wanna end the work with a release. It stops us letting the scope slip and actually only allows us to reduce it because we wanna release at the end and we're not waiting around to release it. Um, we have to work with potential stakeholders to develop both push and pull. 
A lot of our projects have come from push, but we want to pull, and hence call out to the community. If you have ideas, please do come and let us know. And then really we want to develop this short feedback loop from operations about needs. You know, uh, a colleague of ours says benefits, benefits not features mentality, and I think that's really important here. At the moment we're doing a lot of prototype stuff, but we may start to make some toolkits. I know I'm at 20, so quick on the wrap up. Uh, we're currently finishing our third wave, as I mentioned. Niall's just finished, Jamie's just his end, Kai and Sarah both finished. Uh, we've got 11 projects completed across a wide range of topics. And we just really want to continue this scheme, increasing the focus on working with trusts, other national NHS organizations, to produce outputs and further grow collaborations with academia. Uh, again, ideas, please. And finally, Python has played a key role in all of this. As you saw, you know, Python was at the bottom of everything. The thing I find it really useful for is going from ideation or prototyping into a useful output, hopefully by others. We'll see. Utilizing and combining open source frameworks in not new but different ways. I never claim anything to be new because I then find it online and be like, oh, it's not new at all. Someone's done this. Um, seeing what is happening at the edge. You know, Python is really great from the point of view that people are doing stuff in Python at the bleeding edge, both in re research and industry. And it means we can share our projects in a consistent way, which we feel is adding to you know, the community of healthcare professionals using general languages and how they can use them, um, you know, producing a growing no uh, knowledge base. And that's it. And only one minute over. <laughs>